Hello and welcome to 50 Thoughts. You know what I love? Batman. And you know why? Because Batman is one of those characters that has stood the test of time for 75 years. And it's pretty amazing when you think about it since he's a character that doesn't have any superpowers. His only superpowers is his wealth and his intelligence. Sure, there's his fighting style in there too, but you gotta remember he's been trained by various different people in different fighting styles and you know becoming the world's greatest detective and he's one of those heroes that because he's so intelligent because he has all these gadgets that you know his money has paid for and because he has just this great detective mindset uh, because of all of his training that he's had you know he's one of those characters that can go up against super villains common street thugs, mutants and aliens, and even other members of the Justice League. And he always lands on top. And that's pretty amazing. And with 75 years, as you can probably guess, there's been various different iterations of the Batman. We've had some that are pretty dark iterations, just like the Nolan or Burden films, and we've had some that were pretty campy. Mainly 1960s Batman and... <sighs> Batman and Robin. But we do get some of those films and sometimes TV shows that land right in the middle where it's somewhat campy so the kids can still enjoy it but it's still kind of dark where the parents can enjoy it too because it does have a darker story to it than some of you know the other kid Batman shows. Does this land in the middle? Does this land in the Batman the Animated Series or Batman Beyond or even Batman Forever type territory that comes with the part campy, part dark? I gotta say no, it doesn't. But, is it at least still entertaining? Well, we're gonna find that out. Today's movie that I will be reviewing for my first review, so be gentle in the comments down below, is Batman Unlimited Monster Mayhem. Now, I haven't watched Animal Instincts, which is the predecessor to this, um, so, if there's things I miss from that movie, please put it down in the comments below. But I think I've taken up too much time with this intro, so let's jump into Batman Unlimited Monster Mayhem. Our story begins at Arkham Asylum, where Solomon Grundy and Silver Banshee are escaping one Halloween night. You know, don't you think there would be an alarm or something? Maybe some armored guards on the outside of Arkham Asylum? I mean... Doesn't it seem a little strange that they're just able to punch their way through the walls and just walk out? Uh, you know, maybe I should give this movie a little bit of slack, right? I mean, maybe it takes place in the early years of Gotham. You know, where, like, Arkham wasn't that huge prison that it is now. Well, a man can wish, right? Because the next scene shows us that we're in... Neo Gotham from Batman Beyond. They reach Neo Gotham and surprisingly, people don't recognize them since they think that they're wearing costumes. Zomba wrestler, nice one. Is he retarded? <laughs> they steal poor man's Batman, Robin, and Green Arrow's car and get into a chase with the GCPD. Nightwing witnesses the chase, and Green Arrow decides to join Nightwing in order to take them down. Green Arrow and Silver Banshee exchange shots at one another before Batman and Red Robin show up in the Batmobile. The Batmobile and the Rogues get separated pretty quickly before Nightwing jumps in and takes on Silver Banshee in the back seat. The Batmobile gets back on track before Silver Banshee takes down the ceiling of the tunnel right in front of him. But that doesn't stop the Batman since he gets the bat drill and starts drilling away at the debris while Green Arrow and Nightwing get whiff of Scarecrow's fear toxin. With Green Arrow and Nightwing defeated by their worst nightmares, Scarecrow joins the Motley crew and the three escape once again. After Batman finally catches up with Green Arrow and Nightwing, we learn that Cyborg is also in Gotham as a guest of honor since he will be revealing the new Inca exhibit at the Gotham Museum. Gotham City welcomes the cybernetic superhero Cyborg. Cyborg is the guest of honor for Gotham Museum's unveiling of their new Inca exhibit. Yes, because when I think of a football star that had to be turned into a cybernetic being of the future due to an almost fatal injury, I definitely think about ancient civilization's history. Just like how I 
pour water on my cereal, listen to Nickelback because I think that they're a good band and not because people despise the band, and it's the same reason why I vote for Donald Trump, since I think he may actually be a good candidate that won't try to proclaim that we will be the country that will turn the interview into a documentary. It is then explained that he found a relic that will be put into the exhibit while a game developer is working on a Batman game. Huh. Virtual reality, huh? Does that mean that because of that game we'll be able to, oh, I don't know, be the Batman? Hmm. I think Rocksteady should get on this because we all know that if Warner Brothers Montreal does it, we're gonna get another Arkham Origins game, aren't we? The game developer known as Gogo Shoto is attacked by one of his fallen colleagues. He evades her but soon realizes that it isn't this unknown character that we only saw for five seconds tops and that his colleague was knocked out cold. He traps himself inside of a room where he hacks into Gotham billboards and signals the Batman. And Batman shows up in the nick of time. A fight between him and the doppelganger reveals that the doppelganger is actually Clayface who then tries to escape. When Batman is hot on his trail, though, Clayface endangers the lives of innocent civilians by hitting a garbage truck with his clay, therefore blocking its view. Batman takes out a tire with a battering, and it swerves into a parked car. Does Allstate have a policy for when your car is damaged by the Batman? While Clayface escapes through the sewer. We also get one of the dumbest ways to put pop culture into a Batman story. Roll clip. Thank you, Batman. Thank you. Quick selfie? You know, I'm starting to believe that this movie takes place after the selfie epidemic of 2020. You know, the big event that sadly killed millions and millions of brain cells and was the catalyst to the poke war between the United States, Canada, and Great Britain. Yeah, sad times. Those were the true dark ages. We cut to Star Labs, where Cyborg is getting upgraded with the ability of flight. So Cyborg doesn't have a need for his T-car anymore? <laughs> oh my god! What have you done to my childhood?! This testing is interrupted when Commissioner Gordon needs Cyborg to help him figure out who stole an AI created by Dr. Ivo. Cyborg cleans up the footage to realize that it is Scarecrow and Silver Banshee who stole it. He informs Gotham's Dark Knight about the break-in, and Batman deduces that they are working for someone with a higher power, since the AI doesn't contain anything that matches their MOs. And while they are making these discoveries, oh, Grundy dresses up as a pizza guy and infiltrates this facility. Let me see the script. That, that just does not sound right at all. Grundy dresses up as a pizza guy to infiltrate the facility. Grundy dresses up as a pizza guy to infiltrate the... Are you serious, movie? Are you trying to tell me that no one will recognize a zombie? Dressed up as a pizza guy! Really? Who thought that this was a good idea? Tell me, who is the mastermind behind this? Because I'm sorry, but this does not look like rotten flesh. And rotten flesh does not look like this. This is skin. This is perfectly normal flesh bones and skin. Grundy here does not have that. So after he is inside, he decides to break his cover and do what he does best, breaks through the wall. Oh yeah! Anyways, the Marines from Alien fires at him and all of them are taken out within a couple of seconds. Come on guys, we all know that a zombie has to be shot in the head in order to kill it. Let me demonstrate. You go like this put it to his head, or maybe just aim it at his head like that, but just for show and tell here, we're just gonna put it right up to the head and go. 
Grundy hurls himself through the door and reaches the atomic battery that the facility was holding. But Nightwing has arrived on the scene to stop Grundy. He, he contacts the Batman before we cut to an ice cream truck van where we meet the next edition of our oversaturated cast of Batman allies and rogues, the Joker. Let's get into a rant. Let's get into a rant. Why is Joker here? We've seen this happen before, people, where the writers cannot think of any new ideas, so they put Joker at the helm and make it so, oh, we know how to write Joker. Anyone can write Joker. Let's put Joker there. That way, you know, it feels like a Batman story. It's so saddening, because you can write a Batman story without Joker. There are plenty of good stories without the Joker, and yet we never tap into those stories. We never try to bring those stories up. Every story that we try to bring up now has Joker in it some way, shape, or form. And it's saddening and it's disappointing because you know what? We could have had a good story here. You know, and we could have had a good story in Arkham Origins. The problem with Arkham Origins is that they made it so Black Mask is the Joker. And you know what? This story didn't need to have Joker in it because the killing joke is coming out soon and that will be a custom written story for Joker. And you know what? It works because that's Joker's big story. Here, it doesn't make sense, especially when you look at the title. Read the title to me and tell me what you hear, right? Just read it to your computer screen. Monsters and Mayhem, right? That, that's the title in the movie. Can you tell me what the monsters are in this movie? Grundy and Clayface, good job. Is there someone that may be on the brink of being a monster? Scarecrow, why? Because he's able to create monsters, right? And you know what, the best example of that is in Batman Begins. We see him use his fear toxin in order to create mental images of monsters in people's minds when they see his mask. And we even see a great example towards the end of that movie where Batman uses his own fear toxin against him and he starts seeing the Batman as a monster. Great use, right? Great use of using Scarecrow as a monster. But here, everyone's kind of pushed aside as a side character while Joker parades around for the last hour of this movie like, I'm the Joker, I'm the main bad guy, ha ha. And you know what? Let's take a look at the box art real quick. Tell me what you see on this box art here. I see Batman riding a dinosaur. Okay. I guess that's later on in the movie. Then we see Scarecrow, pretty well-known Batman villain. And we see Joker, another pretty known Batman villain. Any way that you put this box art out to people, you see the problem with it. Joker is on the cover, and the only thing monstrous about the Joker is his personality. The mayhem is coming into the writing, okay? The writing for this movie just went down the drain because Joker's here now. Anyways, the Joker opens the trunk for Grundy, who has smashed through yet another wall, and Grundy puts the atomic battery in the back. But Nightwing intervenes and takes Grundy on while the Joker drives off. But Joker is being followed by Batman's mechanical wolf. Wait, wasn't it a mechanical T-Rex on the cover? <sighs> Great continuity, guys. While well, he Batman swoops in from above. The wolf transforms into a mortar. Oh come on, this is Batman, not Transformers. I mean what does Batman and Transformers have in common? Oh right, they sell! So let's put the two together and we'll get a bunch of money! We got back to see that Nightwing has been defeated by Grundy, only to see Grundy escape before we cut back to Joker in the Batman chase. Joker distracts Batman while Grundy, on his scooter, flies off the bridge in front of him. Batman crashes his Transformer into Grundy, throwing him off the bridge. Grundy enters Joker's truck for one scene I wish I could remove from my memory. Oh, Grundy, I could kiss you, you big galoot. In fact, I will! <laughs> no! No, don't try to make this a thing! No, no, please, don't make that a thing, okay? Just, 
No. We cut to a rundown amusement park, since that is always Joker's go-to hideout in these movies. I mean, seriously, wouldn't that be the first place you look for the Joker? Where Joker tries to convince Gogo Shoto to help him for his big practical joke. We then cut to the Batcave, which is actually one of the best things about this movie because it looks so cool, where Tim Drake, aka Red Robin, is playing one of Gogo Shoto's VR games. Tim stops playing the game in order to help Bruce to figure out why Clayface, Silver Banshee, Grundy, and Scarecrow would work for the Joker and what the Joker wants from a video game developer. But their works come to a stop when Alfred reminds them that they have to go to the grand opening of the Inca exhibit. But Bruce tells Alfred to inform Dick and Ollie that they will be needed, and Tim explains why he can't go. Oh no, I hate the museum. Why would I want to look at a bunch of boring old-fashioned ways to do things when I have all this cool tech to do it for me? We then cut to the Inca exhibit, and let's play a game of what doesn't belong here. Is it this mask? No, it seems to fit in quite well, actually. How about this llama? No, but you're on the right track. Is it the dinosaur that the continuity error on the box art is based off of? Ding, ding, ding! We have a winner! Cyborg gets pulled into a conversation with Bruce and this rich woman stereotype, and Bruce explains to her that Cyborg is the one that found all the Incan items, including an Incan energy stone. He notices that Ollie and Dick have arrived and excuses himself from the conversation. Bruce explains that after stealing the game developer, who he called a hacker, which doesn't make any sense, since the last time I checked he didn't make Pokemon Flora Sky, an AI and the atomic battery makes him believe that our frightening five will try to get the ink and power stone tonight. Bruce is right about his prediction, and Joker lets the T-Rex go nuts. I'm a mother T-Rex! T-Rex! I'm a mother T-Rex! T-Rex! When Gordon and his men open fire, we realize that the T-Rex is actually Clayface. Cyborg tries to fight it, but destroys part of the museum before getting tossed aside. Green Arrow, Nightwing, and Batman show up soon after to aid the Titan. And Batman chases after the Joker, who has now stolen the ink and stone, while the others take on Clayface. But Clayface smacks him away with his tail, and then blends into the crowd, making his escape from the scene. Our Frightful Five sit outside of the front doors of the museum in the stolen car. Good lord, how have these guys not been caught yet? Well, I guess knowing... How everything else in this city goes, it probably is on the same logic of the guy who wrote Batmite. So, whoever wrote Batmite clearly wrote this story because Batmite was stupid and every single character that isn't a main character is apparently stupid too. There's no room for Joker in the car, so Joker calls forth his Joker cycle. Joker launches an EMP, taking out the Transformer, Batmobile, and Red Robin's glider he borrowed from Green Goblin. But this isn't your ordinary EMP. It's a computer virus that hacks into the Transformer and Cyborg. Clayface takes Cyborg and heads off with the rest of the Frightful Five. We see that Joker's virus has hacked him into everything on the digital grid, and Joker announces that he is the King of Gotham. He also announced that Solomon Grundy is the new... Oh, come on! Another costume for Grundy? <sighs> okay, I'm gonna say now. Grundy sucks! You know why? Because he's not taken seriously one bit. He's just the comic relief of the movie. And you know what? Like I said before, he could have been a good part of this movie. You know, he could have been taken seriously. He could have been a huge threat. But no, they have to play the dumb card on him. Because, oh, zombies don't have brains, so let's make them the dumb ones of the group. And let's, you know, see how many hijinks we can get them in with that. And it's like... Stop abusing your character here. I want to see, you know, Grundy do Grundy things, not what Lego Grundy would do. After Batman has his chat with Gordon about doing what he can, he returns to the Batcave where the rest of our heroes are trying to get the Batcave back online using gas generators. Joker then pops up on the monitors, requiring and demanding that the city of Gotham throw him a parade. Joker, you did that already. Let me know when you have an original idea. So they come to the conclusion that everyone except them made before they even show the hideout and our scene fades to the location. After some bickering between our group of rogues, Joker decides to roll on his motorcycle. We see that Batman and Red Robin are on top of the warehouse and they give Green Arrow the signal from across the pier. 
Green Arrow shoots a gas arrow into the room with the baddies, bringing them out into the open. Green Arrow takes on Banshee, while Red Robin takes on Clayface. Clayface uses shape-shifting abilities to try to confuse Red Robin, but it doesn't work. Red Robin finds Cyborg and Go-Go Shoto before he is confronted by Clayface in his original form. Batman lures Grundy into the- Oh come on, writers, why are you trying to press this relationships with the dead thing? Nobody wants that! NOBODY WANTS THAT! THIS IS BATMAN, NOT TWILIGHT! We then cut the Banshee breaking Arrow's bow before we cut to Nightwing in the House of Mirrors. Red Robin throws some sort of bombs into Clayface. Batman throws a battering at an electrical pipe, grabbing it, and then shocking Grundy who is standing in water. Arrow knocks out Banshee with baseballs, and Nightwing just punches the Scarecrow. Joker returns, because the plot said that he had to come back, with Cyborg, the Wolf Bike, the Batmobile, and the Batwing. While the Bat family takes on Cyborg and all of Batman's vehicles, Joker frees his rogues, making that last fight scene completely pointless! While being attacked by Cyborg, Red Robin sends Gogo Shoto away on his new Goblin Glider. And somehow he knows how to fly the hoverboard and know the location that Red Robin's talking about. Now, I understand, you know, Red Robin could have told him the, the coordinates to the location, you know, off camera and things like that. But that still doesn't explain how he doesn't know how to fly the glider. Cyborg tries to resist the virus that Joker gave him, but he still fights the Red Robin. Nightwing disables the Batwing by punching the interior wiring before it goes out of Earth's atmosphere. Batman cuts the Batmobile's gas tank and creates a spark that ignites the gas that is poured out of the Batmobile, causing it to explode. Green Arrow fires two arrows at a set of cables, which drops a rocket on the wolf, crushing it. And Red Robin doesn't defeat Cyborg, so the others come to help him. Batman clogs Cyborg's arm cannon with the battering, causing it to backfire. Then Green Arrow uses an explosive arrow to blow open a truck containing water. And Nightwing drops his electronic skirmish stick into the water to electrocute and finish off Cyborg. We return to our rogues and learn that the AI is linked up and is ready to be uploaded in 10 hours. But meanwhile, at GCPD, Batman informs Gordon about how to defeat the Joker at his parade tonight and that Gordon's help will be needed. But our meeting is disbanded when Grundy busts through the door. Meanwhile, at the Batcave, Gogo explains that the Joker had him create the virus and is going to be using the stolen AI to spread it across the globe. A broadcast interrupts Gogo, and we learn that the Joker, along with the AI, is at the Channel 6 news station, and Gogo gives Batman a VR visor before he leaves. The visor would allow him to get into the AI world once he reaches the station. Joker's parade is going on. Sorry, wrong clip. And we see Grundy commanding the police force to spot out Batman and his friends so he can shoot them with the RPG. Gordon is as shocked as I am to see him with it and decides to waste Grundy's ammo by telling him to shoot at the buildings. Saying that he saw Batman there. You just instructed Grundy, to destroy the city you were sworn to protect. And you know what? The worst thing is, the crowd believes that these are fireworks. Was 9-11 fireworks in this universe? Your city is getting destroyed. And you're just sitting there clapping? Oh my god, movie! Grundy runs out of ammo and Gordon gives him the drop with a trapdoor that he was standing on where he is now restrained. Out of the crowds, Green Arrow starts a revolt against Silver Banshee's singing, causing a distraction. He then fires a knockout gas arrow during the distraction, therefore taking Banshee out of the picture. Finally, Nightwing drops him behind Scarecrow and tases him with his skirmish sticks, while Red Robin throws quick hardening cement bombs into Clayface. While the parade is going on, Batman taps into the AI with his visor, which makes him look cooler than his normal cowl, if you ask me, and enters the AI in some kind of Matrix style. Joker knows that he's in the AI and joins himself. Joker turns Batman into, uh, Fat Man? Seriously, like, that's one of the oldest Batman memes in the book. 
Joker decides to pull on Mr. Smith and creates several versions of himself. Batman runs away, but doesn't get too far when the Jokers turn into pterodactyls. Batman returns to his normal weight, for some reason, and glides off. The pterodactyls eventually hit his glider, causing him to crash. Luckily, he spawns in the dinosaur from the cover. Now I see where that comes from. And uses the lasers on it to revert the flying dinos back to Jokers, and in the process, creating more Jokers. Joker believes that he has won, but Batman's antivirus software is turned on so whenever he or his B-Rex, as the Joker called him, hits a Joker, they would turn into a Batman. And then those Batman could attack the Joker clones and turn them into Batman. So then the Batman outnumbered the Jokers until there are none left. After arresting the criminals, Cyborg shows up to our four heroes and starts yet another fight with them. Why am I not surprised? Nightwing is the first to be taken down by Cyborg, simply by Cyborg throwing Nightwing's nightstick right back at him. And Red Robin is next to fall pretty much because of a single punch by the Cyborg. Since Batman's antivirus software worked, shortly after this fight has started, it quickly ended due to everything being restored to the way it once was. Batman chases after the Joker who escapes through the streets of Gotham in a Joker robot. Okay, I was gonna let some of the other copycats pass. You know, the Red Robin's glider being, you know, pretty much the gli the new Goblin glider from Spider-Man 3. I was gonna let, you know, the Wolf Cycle being a Transformer thing slide. You know, but when you have to rip off Lego Batman 2, that's sad. Because you know what? There's no context for this robot. This is just padding for the last 10 minutes of your film. That way you can make this a movie. You know, that way this is, this fits the movie time frame of an hour and 30 minutes. That's all this is for. This robot, which shows up out of nowhere, you know, I, I doubt that Gogo Shoto built it, so there's no explanation there. Uh, you know, there's no reason for this to be in the movie. There's no reason for this to be here. There's no explanation for why this is here. It's just, it's here. Woo, buy the toy, buy the toys. You know, it, this is ridiculously stupid. It didn't work in Lego Batman 2 too much and it doesn't work here. You don't build up to this at all. It's just, here it is, here it is. And you know what, I, I take that back. There is a similarity here. Not just because it's a giant Joker robot between Lego Batman 2 and this. Lego Batman 2, Lex Luthor gave him the suit. That way he could, you know, Lex Luthor do his all take over the world thing. He, the, he gave him the robot. That way he could just distract, right? The writers of this movie gave him the robot to distract your children for the last 10 minutes of this film instead of having you turn it off as soon as you saw, oh look, the Joker is defeated, you know, the virus is canceled, everything is fine, boys and girls, yay, end the movie. No, you throw this in here to add 10 extra more minutes to the film, and it clearly does not work, because at this point, I just have my hand here, and my head in it like this, and going, end, now. Cyborg takes on the Joker sword, while Batman and the others grab vehicles from the museum. Batman flies overhead shooting it while Dick and Tim use the Joker bot to create ramps so they can vault over it and drop bombs onto the Joker bot's head. With the bot weakened, Green Arrow rolls in with his tank and shoots the Joker bot, destroying the rest of it. Joker pops out of the robot in his own Iron Man suit. For God's sake, just end already! And Batman pursues after him. Cyborg joins Batman in the chase and they realize that Cyborg is the second transmitter for the virus. So Cyborg finds the spot where he needs to merge the crystal with Joker's suit to disable the transmitter and punches his arm through it, therefore saving the day. All the rogues are sent back to Arkham with the selfie kid taking a, a picture with them, showing how stupid this movie still is since who would ever let a kid get that close to them? And Joker escapes so he can show up in the sequel. Okay, so now that the movie's finished, you're probably wondering, what do I think about it? Well, if you look here, you can see my rating scale. It's from one to five stars, and one is pretty bad. One is pretty bad. Two is it's bad, but still had some good features. Three is it's okay. Four is it's actually pretty good. 
and five is it's one of the better movies that I've seen. Um, so where does this fall? A, a lot of people would guess it's in the ones, but for me it's actually in the twos, and I'll explain why. This film has very good character designs. Besides Joker and Batman's, I really liked all the rest of the character designs, and it really helps that they have good animation behind those character designs to make them feel more like the characters that they're trying to portray. The animation is very good and is pretty much on par for DC animated films, which is pretty high. Another thing that's pretty good in the film is its voice acting. You have Terry McGinnis playing Nightwing, aka Will Friedel, and you have Troy Baker as Joker, and both of them really get that kind of feel that, yes, this is Nightwing, this is Joker across instead of just seeing Nightwing as Terry McGinnis. But that's where the positives kind of stop. The storyline is very messed up. It is a lot of action, not a lot of explaining, and probably would have worked better as a video game. Maybe a Lego Batman game. Another thing too is that there were missed opportunities with this story. Joker should not been the focus. I feel like the focus should have been Scarecrow. Scarecrow should have been the main villain and had it so Solomon Grundy and Silver Banshee escape from Arkham. They meet up with Clayface and Clayface takes them to Scarecrow where Scarecrow pretty much shows off the same kind of idea. We're going to try to take over the city. Let's change the power outage with Fear Toxin and say, yes, this is what we're going for. Silver Banshee is very skeptical because she thought, oh, I'm just escaping. I can go back to Metropolis being the Superman villain that I am. But she gets roped into this whole thing and is very weary about the other characters that she's working with because they are Batman villains and probably have worked together in the past. She would be the odd man out and that would add a little bit of more interesting factors to the villains and seeing that group kind of crumble a little bit because of her. Now another thing too is Red Robin's characterization. I feel like he should have been more of Arkham City's Robin than Lego Batman's Tim Drake Robin. It felt like he was miscategorized. You see him as this older Robin figure, but yet he's still acting like a child and it doesn't make that much sense. I feel like that should have been changed. Another thing with characters is Grundy's character. Grundy, like I said before, I feel like should have been taken more seriously instead of being a comic relief character. He could have been taken more seriously and I would have liked to see the writers take that approach to this character. Is this a bad film? No, it's not terrible, but it isn't that good either, mainly due to the writing and its pacing. Pacing is another bad thing with this movie because every time you go into a fight, you see one minute of of one character fighting another character, then you jump to the other one, then you jump back, and then you jump again to see the other one get defeated. It really feels very choppy when they do that, and it's very annoying. But besides those two big things, plus the characterizations, it's not bad, but it's not good either. It's not an okay movie due to that stuff, but it still had some things going for it, and that's why I gave it the two-star rating, is it does have the potential, it's just the execution was horrible. And it could have been a good film if they truly tried. I have been 5150 Nighthawk02, and we will see you next time.